The PBC live video feed is underway. Peter B. Collins! Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Friday, December 15th, 2017. This is our final Facebook live video feed for this year. I'm heading out to a holiday party a little bit later today. I got one of my holiday shirts on. And it's been a dizzying pace following the news over the past week, and we certainly have a lot to talk about. And as you know, the reason I host this podcast live on Facebook on Fridays is so that you can call in. This is a nationwide call-in talk show with the bald guy at the secret studio ready to hear from you. I've got the phone number posted right now. It's 415-455-07. Oh, that's the wrong line. <laughs> 415-455-0102. 415-455-0102. Yeah, I have too many phone lines, and it's hard to keep them all tracked. Uh, but I would like to hear from you. You can comment on any issue that I mention or bring up something of your own. That's the way it works here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast. So this is day one, post-net neutrality. And we're still live on Facebook my speeds have not been throttled yet. <laughs> but what we are going to see right now is a round of lawsuits and some tub thumping by legislators. Members of Congress are hoping to overturn the FCC's action. They do have the prerogative to do that, but I don't think they have the votes. And so it will be up to the judicial branch, I think, to resolve the issues of access to the Internet and whether it remains a, a so-called level playing field. And for my money, the big issue here is that the ISPs, the Internet service providers, do not want to be regulated as common carriers. And that's essentially what net neutrality was based on in Tom Wheeler's move as FCC chair under Obama. And the regulation of common carrier requires them to treat all traffic equally. The common carrier goes back to interstate commerce, the trucking industry, the railroad industry, giving every shipper equal access to facilities. And while we're not shipping product or <laughs> head of cattle, what we're shipping is our ideas, comprised of words and videos and audio. And I hope that we do see that it remains unrestricted and that they don't install a fast lane so that a big user like Netflix can hog the bandwidth, uh, buy it at a lower rate, but get higher delivery speeds? That is a possibility. Now, I think uh, the first thing that we'll see in terms of changes will be low-cost packages offered on an a la carte basis. So right now at our house, we are, are paying the extortionist rate of $192 a month for Internet, for cable, and that includes an HBO subscription, uh, and for a single landline. It's all bundled, and we have no choice but to work with either Comcast or AT&T. And so what may change is they, they'll say, well, look, you may not want to pay $192 a month. Maybe you just want email. Maybe you just want social media. Maybe you just want to be able to watch Netflix on your computer. That's how I think initially they will carve this up. And if the deregulation of the airlines is any indication, what we're going to see is class distinctions. The more you pay, the more you get. The less you pay, well, <laughs> you don't get a window seat. You uh, don't get a free bag. And you certainly don't get a free lunch anymore. And David Spark, who is a very bright Internet consultant, he actually helped me as I developed this podcast. He's just posted on Facebook, ironic that the argument to repeal net neutrality is exactly the same argument to keep net neutrality. More competition, better for consumers. Good point, David. Thank you. So uh, the other thing we're going to see is a lot of lawsuits. And we see state legislators in Washington, in California, and elsewhere saying that they're going to sponsor legislation to provide for net neutrality on a state level. 
I think that's a nice idea. It may be popular with voters, but it's not going to fly. The FCC, I do believe, will be able to claim uh, jurisdiction and preemption over any state-level attempt to uh, regulate in a fair manner. So it is, I think, ultimately going to be up to the courts to decide this important issue. Now, this is part of a bigger package. Trump sees himself as the guy who is rescuing a strangled nation from onerous regulations that prevent business from doing what it needs to do and prevent the entrepreneurial spirit from flourishing in this country. And it's a whole lot of bullshit, but he staged a photo op yesterday at the uh, White House in the Roosevelt Room, and they had two stacks of paper. One was taller than Trump, and it's what, one, two, three, four, it's uh, five piles deep. Well, it's a total of 15 piles. And they claim that that, regula- uh, that represents the amount of federal regulation that is on the books today. And then in a stack that doesn't even reach Trump's knee, they claim that was the status of regulation 100 years ago. Now, we've come a long way, baby. And a lot of regulations I consider to be extremely valuable and life-saving. And maybe they cost uh, the corporate uh, people a little bit of money here and there. But overall, regulations are good for the industries that are regulated because it doesn't allow competitors to get an edge by being a greater polluter or exploiting tax laws more effectively than a competitor. And so the idea that all regulation is bad is just a big lie. And the idea that uh, we can value these regulations by the pound or by the number of pages that the regulations uh, uh, fill up, is sheerly ridiculous. And let me just give you a couple of examples that happen to be in the news today. Mountaintop mining. That is the ugliest way to extract coal, which of course is the ugliest carbon relic that we continue to exploit for energy purposes today. And mountaintop mining, at the beginning of the Obama administration, represented a huge uh, proportion of the amount of coal mining that was underway. And under Obama, the amount of this mountaintop mining, which is where you blow off the top of the mountain, you let all that debris just roll down into the hollers, as they say in West Virginia, and it pollutes the downstream in a massive way. Most of the tops of the mountains are never put back in place, and so it just destroys the landscape, in order to extract the coal. So the uh, amount of mountaintop mining declined by 62% from 2008 to 2014. About 40% of central Appalachia has been flattened by 40 years of mountaintop mining, according to a study that was completed last year. Well, uh, the Interior Department lifted a moratorium on new coal mining in federal lands, In October, the Environmental Protection Agency announced a repeal of a clean power plan that would have favored solar power over keeping coal plants burning. And last February, Trump signed a repeal of a clean stream rule that raised the prospects of a mountaintop mining revival. All of this against the backdrop that there is very little market for coal anymore and that this is, uh, you know, simply a sop to an industry that Trump favors, and they favored him with campaign contributions. And this is a very ugly rollback of regulations that were intended to protect a lot of the uh, areas that have coal and, uh, you know, stop this really egregious form of extraction. I'm looking at a comment from George, who is over in the Netherlands, He says he pays $89 a month for basic cable, basic voiceover internet phone service, and unlimited broadband uh, with a top rate of about 400 megabits per second. That's faster than I got, George. So uh, that's a pretty decent rate. But, of course, we don't have competitive internet speeds here in the United States, and we often pay top dollar, as you heard in (laughs) what I described about our cable bill. If you'd like to make a comment, I'd like to hear from you today. My lines are open here at the Peter B. Collins podcast at 415-455-0102.
You want to talk about regulations? You want to talk about the rollback of net neutrality? I welcome your comments. So Rexon Tillerson, not my favorite Secretary of State in American history, former head of ExxonMobil, but it appears that he's being run out of the Trump administration on a rail. And this week, apparently, he was seen as too soft on war with North Korea. And I covered this in a podcast a couple of days ago, that Tillerson has softened the American position regarding preconditions for talks with North Korea. At one point he said no preconditions, and then he said, well, (laughs) we need him to stop the missile launches and the nuclear testing for a while. I think that's a precondition. At any rate, this really pissed off Trump, and this has led to a wave of new leaks from the White House to the Washington Post. The article today says that, uh, and this is based on all anonymous sources uh, claimed to be inside the Trump White House, that uh, Tillerson went off script by offering the invitation for diplomatic talks with North Korea. They prefer war in the Trump White House. And we know that it's extremely dangerous to try to launch any military action against North Korea because hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of South Koreans uh, will likely be killed in the first round of, uh, of any kind of a military exchange. And uh, Elizabeth notes about Tillerson. She says he's being run out because he's not hawkish enough. And she advises, let that sink in. Yes, please do. So, again, I'm not a big fan of Tillerson. I don't think bringing a corporate executive who had a big deal to extract oil and natural gas in Russia makes for a great diplomat. But by Trump's standards, he's shown himself to be somewhat independent. He has taken to the job. And while he is uh, decimating the State Department in the view of many of the insiders at the State Department... I don't see a basis for Trump to sack him at this point, except that he is a peevish, ignorant joke of a president. And that's about enough of that story. There are two interesting pieces published this week that I would like to alert you to. And I want to thank Robert Blumen, a listener and subscriber, who tipped me off to this one at The American Conservative. And this is the kind of commentary you won't find in the so-called liberal media. It's written by Daniel Martin, who's from Pennsylvania. I've never heard of him before. But he writes, Wither the Anti-War Movement. And he notes that uh, from the early days of the Iraq War, the anti-war movement has been a small, ineffectual pinprick on the post-9-11 landscape. A less generous assessment is that it's been a bust. After liberals helped elect the anti-war Barack Obama, the movement all but disappeared, even though the wars did not. By putting a Nobel Peace Prize winning Democrat uh, face on his inherited wars, Obama expanded into new conflicts, Libya, Syria, Yemen, with little resistance, ultimately bombing seven different countries during his tenure. And I've made a similar quote before. He cites Code Pink founder Medea Benjamin. We've been protesting Obama's foreign policy for years now, but we can't get the same numbers because the people who would have been yelling and screaming about this stuff under Bush are quiet under Obama. And the essay goes on, perhaps the movement's biggest weakness was that it shied away from directly attacking its own, the liberal Democrats who voted for war in Congress. And he points out that out of 77 senators who supported the resolution to go into Iraq, voted on in 2002, 20 are still in office, half are Democrats. While of the 296 votes in favor in the House, 90 are still in office, and more than half, 57, are Democrats. So the Democratic Party is not an anti-war party, even though some people see it that way. And there's also a movement on the right that was led by libertarian Ron Paul. And this commentary says the same thing happened to the anti-war right as the Ron Paul movement took off in 2008 with an immense level of grassroots energy. One of the singular successes of this movement was the ability to reach people on an intellectual and practical level 
about the folly of our foreign interventions and the waste, fraud, and abuse of tax dollars. So Daniel Martin is described as an anti-war activist, musician, and rock journalist from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I've linked to his article in the show file for today's podcast. And likewise, Andrew Basevich, who I think is one of the best critical thinkers on American military policy in recent years. He is a retired Army colonel. He lost a son in the war in Iraq. He taught history at Boston University. He's retired from there now. And in an article at Tom Dispatch this week, he takes a look at the Me Too movement and the swift move to zero tolerance for sexual harassment and sexual assault. And he asks, where is the outrage when it comes to America's nonstop wars? Now he says, in no way would I wish to diminish the pain, suffering, and humiliation of the women preyed upon, preyed upon by the various reprobates now getting their belated comeuppance. But none of the perpetrators are charged with having committed murder. No one died. Compare, compare their culpability to that of the highest-ranking officials who have presided over or promoted this country's various military misadventures of the present century. Those wars, of course, have resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths and will ultimately cost American taxpayers many trillions of dollars. Nor have those costly military efforts eliminated terrorism, as President George W. Bush promised back when today's GIs were still in diapers. Instead, our wars have sown disorder and instability, creating failing or failed states across the greater Middle East and Africa. In their wake, we have sprung up even more, not fewer, jihadist groups, while acts of terror are soaring globally. These are indisputable, indisputable facts, says Basevich. In a similar fashion, war has become a habit to which the United States is addicted. Except for the terminally distracted, most of us know that. We also know, we cannot not know, that in places like Afghanistan and Iraq, U.S. forces have been unable to accomplish their assigned mission despite more than 16 years of fighting in Afghanistan and more than a decade in Iraq. Vladimir Putin held his annual news conference. It goes on for four hours. It's broadcast nationally. I think he even takes phone calls. By the way, if you want to call in, my lines are open for you today, 415-455-0102. Now, he took a lot of questions about domestic issues in Russia. But at one point, he took up the cause of the embattled Donald Trump. And he says that the whole Trump-Russia narrative is spy hysteria. This is all made up by people who oppose Trump to make his work look illegitimate, said Putin. And he added that there is a deep state in the United States that fosters hostility toward Moscow. Do they want to ban all contact, he says? Well, Putin has a point there. And I covered this earlier this week. And I know that you probably are conditioned to think of Peter B. Collins as this guy who is just a, a sharp skeptic of the whole Trump-Russia narrative. He doesn't believe that Russia hacked the DNC because there's been no public proof provided. But that doesn't stop me from continuing to examine the issues and any evidence that surfaces. And earlier this week, Susan Pittis, who's watching on the video feed right now, she sent me a link to an article from Fortune magazine. That's a business publication. And it cited an article from the Russian website called The Bell. And I've learned that the Bell is uh, affiliated with Forbes, the American business magazine that competes with Fortune. And the Fortune story reported that a Russian hacker named Konstantin Kozlovsky, who is on trial alongside 50 other people for allegedly creating a virus called Lurk that uh, rifled uh, 1.7 billion rubles, about $28 million, from Russian banks. And we are told that in August, he made a stunning confession that he was the guy who hacked the DNC on orders from the Russian security organ, the FSB. And so this surfaced on Monday or Tuesday in Fortune. And I noted that the corporate media outlets that have been, you know, just so quick to pounce on anything about Trump and Russia, 
and who got badly burned a week ago today by the email from an unknown guy named Michael Erickson that alerted the Trumps that WikiLeaks had published emails of Hillary Clinton. The media got the date wrong, and CNN led them over the cliff. There was no news there. And it emboldens Trump to call out the media on all counts as publishing fake news. And I believe we have a true crisis in our media because of that. So anyway, back to the Kozlovsky story. He's made this claim, but the claim was in a Facebook post that was published in August when Konstantin Kozlovsky was locked up in a Russian prison while he's on trial. Do they have special access to Facebook in Russian prisons? Well, that's only the question I can ask. I don't really know. So the other curious thing here is that Kozlovsky says that he has worked for the FSB, and he also claims that he has hacked Hillary Clinton's emails. Now, no one has ever asserted that Hillary Clinton's State Department emails were hacked. She held on to a bunch of them and held back 30,000 that were ultimately pried loose or mostly pried loose. But we have no evidence that her emails were ever hacked. So he is making a claim (laughs) that appears not substantiated by the evidence. And that calls into question the credibility of Kozlovsky. And it underscores that the corporate media has been very cautious about pursuing the story. Only BuzzFeed has uh, published an article about it. I'd like to hear your comments. That's why I'm here on Facebook Live. 415-455-0102 is my number. 415-455-0102. I'd like to hear from you today. Stephen F. Cohen is a veteran Russia expert. And... He, like me, is skeptical of the Russiagate narrative. And in a piece that was republished today at Consortium News, Bob Perry's site, he talks about the scary void inside Russiagate. He opens with this, The foundational accusation of Russiagate was and remains. Charges that Putin ordered the hacking of the DNC emails and their public dissemination through WikiLeaks in order to benefit Trump and undermine Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election and that Trump and or his associates colluded with the Kremlin in this attack on American democracy. And Professor Cohen, retired from Columbia, says, as no actual evidence for these allegations has been produced nearly a a year and a half of media, I'm sorry, after nearly a year and a half of media and government investigations, we are left with Russiagate without Russia. Indeed, the several investigations desperate to find actual evidence of collusion have spread to contacts with Russia, political, financial, social, etc. And as I've pointed out, this is turning away from collusion and more toward corruption. And the charges against Paul Manafort, his colleague Rick Gates, and the uh, uh, plea deal with Papadopoulos, and also the uh, plea deal for lying to the FBI by General Flynn, These are all about corruption. They're not about collusion. They're not about the central foundational charges uh, of Russiagate. And so as the scandal morphs, this becomes a a very different critter. And he also notes that uh, as a Russia expert, he maintains contacts with many Russians that today can be viewed in a very dark and conspiratorial way. He also, in this piece, References Glenn Greenwald's takedown of the corporate media fail a week ago today. And he comes to the defense of uh, Mike Flynn, saying it wasn't against the law for him to communicate with the Russian ambassador. But uh, he does note that uh, Flynn apparently lied about that. And then he defends Rexon Tillerson. He says there's the ongoing effort by the political media establishment to drive Secretary of State Tillerson from office and replace him with a fully neocon, anti-Russian, anti-detente head of the State Department. Tillerson was an admirable appointee by Trump, says Cohen. Well, I don't agree with that, but he's entitled to that opinion. 
and he's more of an expert than I am. Hi, are you calling the Peter B. Collins podcast? Somebody did there. Go ahead and grab a line at 415-455-0102 if you have a comment you'd like to share. Now, I really don't know much about Omar Rosa Manigault Newman. I only know she was a contestant on The uh, Apprentice, a show that I refuse to watch, and I'm proud of that. Well, this actress has left her job as a communications person in the Trump White House. And that means there are no African-American females currently serving at uh, higher levels in the Trump White House right now. And he, uh, uh, I'm sorry, she, appears to be setting up a career of a little kiss and tell because she's been making the rounds to morning shows and media interviews and saying that uh, she witnessed things that uh, really bothered her. But she appears intent on dribbling these out a little at a time. I imagine she's auditioning for a book deal here. And so uh, we have to treat her as an opportunist. But it does appear that the latest White House Chief of Staff, General Kelly, uh, reached a breaking point with her and it is in dispute that he ordered her escorted off the grounds of the White House and that she was attempting to get into the uh, Oval Office or to the private quarters of the president. So I don't know the details of that, but Omarosa says, as the only African-American woman in this White House, as a senior staff and assistant to the president, I have seen things that have made me uncomfortable, that have upset me, that have affected me deeply and emotionally, and that's the key to a book pitch with a major publisher and a seven-figure advance. Today in the New York Times, Carl Hulse has an analytical piece about the accusations against President Trump of groping, of sexual harassment, and of rape of a teenager. These are very serious charges, and there are multiple accusers. And after the Democrats uh, reach the high road, after trampling John Conyers and Al Franken along the way, they have now turned their sights on Trump, and there are six members of the U.S. Senate, maybe seven, who are calling for him to resign. And I agree that these are serious charges. There's a video I saw on Facebook this morning that is based on the court transcript of a woman who worked for Jeffrey Epstein for several years procuring young women to populate his parties and to be available for sexual play with Epstein and his pal, Donald Trump. And one of the vivid descriptions is of a an incidence of rape where Trump threatened to have the woman and her family killed if she ever talked about it. So these are not he-said-she-said said charges. Some are progressing through lawsuits. And I'm glad that the Democrats are calling out Trump. I don't know why they waited so long. But simply calling for his resignation, I consider to be a pretty empty effort. And why the Democrats are so allergic to impeachment is really beyond me. Because even if it doesn't happen right away, it is a rallying call for Democrats and for people opposed to Trump to participate in the primaries in 2018 and to change up the Congress. Now, this week in Alabama, while I considered it to be a, a really unusual case, you know, how often do you have a Bible-thumping candidate who is accused of uh, 30 years ago sexual assault on teenage girls and then being uh, kind of a predatory creep around teenage girls? That doesn't happen very often in a deep red state. So I consider Alabama to be completely anomalous. But we're seeing commentary like this. Now possible uh, Senate looks like a toss-up in 2018. And it's true that the Republicans only have a two-seat advantage. A third of the Senate is up for re-election, but most of those seats are Democrats who have to defend them. And so the idea that the Senate could shift into Democratic hands is within reach, but not with the cautious 
kind of politics that the Democrats are practicing. And unless they come out and fully argue for Medicare for all, they don't have to put a promised date on delivery. They simply have to articulate that that is the goal of the Democratic Party. And if they were to do so, coupled with a call for impeachment and the requisite number of Congress members and senators to pull that off, there could be a wave election in 2018. But later today, I'm releasing to my subscribers an in-depth interview with our friend Norman Solomon, progressive Democrat, co-founder of RootsAction.org, and he was a Bernie Sanders delegate to the convention last year. And Norman Solomon attended the meeting in Washington last weekend of the so-called Democratic Unity Reform Commission. And what he came away with is that it is corporate controlled, just like the DNC was last year and just like it is this year. Here's an excerpt from my conversation with Norman Solomon about the Democratic Unity Forum. The commission, the party, is controlled by people who don't want to hear from the grassroots. And those who know, know. (laughs) Well, unfortunately, um, we're going to have to engage in a struggle in 2018 between the top of the Democrat National Committee and the progressive grassroots. And we're going to move now to the phase of what they call the Rules and Bylaws Committee, which takes these recommendations uh, and votes on them, and then the full DNC will vote before the end of next year. It might sound a little arcane or inside baseball, but the question is, will the people who vote as delegates to choose the nominee of the next um, presidential candidate of the Democratic Party, will they all be responsive to and reflecting the views and ballots cast by voters, or will hundreds and hundreds of them, including the ones who first get to declare their public preferences, be superdelegates who are lobbyists, who are elitists, who are not chosen for that purpose at all? That's Norman Solomon. He talks about the issue of superdelegates there, and the Reform Commission is recommending to the full DNC that the superdelegates be cut by more than 50%. I think it's about 60%. Uh, But this goes to the Rules Committee, which will dilute it, and then to the full Democratic National Committee. And will those people, most of whom are superdelegates, vote to limit their influence in the future? I'd like to hear from you. Do you think the Democratic Party can be saved from the corporate and establishment forces that control it today? Will it listen to the Sanders left and to the populist liberals who really want to end the wars, stop funding the Pentagon, stop going soft on Trump's appointees? These are big questions. I'd like to hear from you if you'd like to offer a comment at 415-455-0102. Now, uh, Elizabeth added another comment here. She asks, is there a Me Too movement? It looks more like these women coming forward with legitimate stories are being instrumentalized by the Democrats to get Trump. Franken looked like a hostage in his resignation video. Well, you make an important point, Elizabeth. And the issue related to Me Too, perhaps it's too much to call it a movement, but uh, this certainly is a Me Too moment. And today, in its lead editorial, the New York Times drops the hammer on Alex Kaczynski, the conservative appeals court justice based here in San Francisco at the Ninth Circuit, who was originally appointed by Reagan. And there are now six women who've come forward. They're not accusing him of uh, sexual acts, but of sexual talk and innuendo, and of uh, repeatedly showing one of his law clerks Uh, porn videos while he was in the court, presumably in his offices, not in a courtroom. And uh, Kaczynski was disciplined by the Judicial Council of the Third Circuit for exhibiting poor judgment because he was reprimanded for keeping pornography on a server that was accessible to the public. So, uh, you know, judges have a lifetime appointment. You can criticize them, you can censure them, you can discipline them, but 
the only way to remove them is through impeachment, and that has only been used occasionally in the American history. So uh, it's interesting to see if we will hold a judge like Kaczynski to the higher standard that we say we expect of a jurist in his position. Dustin Hoffman is facing additional accusations. Uh, more women have come forward to uh, who says say that as teenagers he exposed himself to them. Uh, there were five women whose stories were published by Variety and The Hollywood Reporter. Dustin Hoffman is 80 years old now, and he has been accused by three other women already. And these charges seem pretty damaging. The one thing I want to mention is that because we are applying these issues retroactively, and I don't want to sound like Harvey Weinstein who's saying, well, you know, in the 60s, everything was different. But it's fair to say that public figures like Dustin Hoffman are often approached by women who can be described as groupies. And they're interested in hanging out with him, having a picture taking, taken, and if they can go to bed with him, there are some women, I don't want to say that this represents these accusers, but there are some women who will, you know, who will do that. <laughs> and I think that there is a potential that some, not, not all, but some of these accusers could be groupies with groupie remorse. And this is where it's so hard to uh, try to judge issues that are being brought up from 20, 30, in some cases 40 years ago. And I still say we need standards, we need a process, we need proportionality. And if you want to think of me as a creep, as one of my listeners has accused me of, look at the op-ed written by Zephyr Teachout, the Fordham Law professor, that was published in the New York Times this week. Tavis Smiley is fighting back after being sacked by PBS. And he is acknowledging that he had what he calls consensual relationships with colleagues. Now, the PBS uh, retained law firm said that he had multiple credible con uh, allegations of conduct that's inconsistent, but that he had a pattern of multiple relationships with subordinates over the years. Now, I think Tavis Smiley deserves to have these accusations aired out. And we need to know if the uh, people who are accusing him are being honest or if they have an axe to grind and if these relationships were, in fact, consensual. And I understand the power differential of a figure like Tavis Smiley. But I am reluctant to just reach a judgment based on accusations from accusers that are not even identified. Now I want to turn to a couple of stories about immigration. Last week, ICE, Immigrations and Custom Enforcement, chartered a jet, and they filled it up with a group of people set for deportation to Somalia. There were 92 people subject to deportation who were put on this plane. And then things went sideways. The flight to Mogadishu left the United States last Thursday. That's a week ago yesterday. But it was grounded in Senegal. And we are told that the issue was that the flight crew uh, had reached its maximum hours and needed a substitute. But the detainees were told that there were mechanical problems with the plane. That plane sat for 46 hours. Well, the, the entire ordeal was 46 hours, but it sat on the runway there for an entire day in very hot temperatures. And the uh, would-be deportees were generally shackled to their seats and not permitted to use the bathroom. And as tensions rose, the goons from ICE were reported to have beaten and uh, otherwise harassed people who were in their custody. Uh, one individual named Muhammad said he was struck in the face, began bleeding as an ICE agent fought his seatmate. He was choking somebody else next to my seat, and he tried to hit the other dude, and I moved out of the way and got hit. 
to cover up the traces, they took his shirt. And this man, Muhammad, is also a diabetic. He said he was denied his insulin and that uh, this caused uh, pain, painful movement, uh, swelling to his legs, and uh, other issues. So uh, this is, uh, you know, snakes on a plane, but the snakes are ICE agents. And this is not an isolated example. On the ground here in the United States, the Inspector General for the Department of Homeland Security has conducted unannounced inspections of six immigrant detention facilities, and every one of them has serious issues. Abuse of solitary confinement, lockdown of detainees, abuse of strip searches, intimidation and threatened retaliation against people with potentially serious concerns uh, about confinement, lack of interpretation services during medical exams, deplorable bathroom maintenance, and refusal to properly supply detainees with hygiene items. And at a lockup here in the Bay Area that's run by the Contra Costa Sheriff's Department, and they lease out jail space to ICE, reports are that women are only allowed to go to the bathroom once a day, and the rest of the time they're given biodegradable plastic bags to do their business in. Now, this is subhuman. It is unconstitutional and un-American. And this doesn't make the corporate media. The report that I'm citing right here is from Kevin Gostola's Shadow Proof. Where's the outrage? We could use a little about now. We're learning that many people have been ethnically and religiously profiled since Trump's first royal travel decree was issued at the end of January this year. And many people who have ethnic surnames, they're American citizens, they live in the United States, they're fully legal, they received the, uh, what's called the, uh, what is it, global clearance? Yeah, global entry. And what you do is you pay a fee, you have a background check, you get fingerprinted, all kinds of pretty intrusive investigations, and then they give you a clearance so you don't have to go through airport security every time you fly. And this one woman, Zaire Saeed, whose father is Yemeni and mother is Lebanese, she said that she has been singled out. And without any provocation or any notice, they simply canceled her global entry clearance. And now it's the equivalent of the no-fly list for her when she goes to the airport. Today, we're told that the Republican wheeling and dealing over the tax cuts for wealthy Americans and corporations has come to an end. That Marco Rubio is going to vote for it because they threw him a bone. He was all worked up and posing yesterday, posturing, that he might not vote for this, this ugly package unless he got more in terms of the child tax credit. Now, this is a refundable credit. And the Republicans have been uh, tweaking it to reduce its value. And essentially, what they gave Marco Rubio is the equivalent of $300 per child per year. And he's declaring victory. Well, the ugly truth is that millions of American children are at risk of losing their health insurance because Congress has failed to renew the CHIP program, Child Health Insurance Program. And I haven't commented on this for a while because I couldn't believe that this wouldn't get fixed in some way. Most Republicans support CHIP. But it was left out of the budget resolution back in September. And we know that at the end of January, almost 5 million children will lose coverage. At the end of February, another 5.5 million will lose coverage. At the end of March, another 7.7 .7 million will lose coverage. And by the end of the summer, an additional 8.4 million children will have no health care. And the $300 a year child tax credit, that won't mean much to a child who dies from a serious health condition or illness and who couldn't get treatment or treatment in a timely manner because there was no health insurance coverage in place. Well, as we wrap up here today, I want to thank those of you watching on Facebook for 
tuning in, clicking in today. Nobody decided to call, and that's okay. But this is my last Facebook video for the year. I'll be podcasting through next Wednesday, then take a good long break for the holidays and be back on January 2nd or January 3rd. And I hope that despite the turbulence of this year, the hate, the ugliness that has really been rawly produced in American culture and media, in interactions between fellow Americans, we are at a low point. And the sad thing is, it may not be the bottom. But I hope that despite the hate, the ugliness, the rancor, the violence that is both uh, being experienced and being planned, that you can find connections with your fellow human beings, with friends, family, lovers, and hunker down through the holidays here. Build a warm fire when they allow you. We have a spare the air day in California, or at least in the northern area today, and Southern California is continuing to fight wildfires. But I hope you'll find that comfort in personal relationships and help recharge. Because heading into 2018, we've got a lot of work to do. And I'll be here with you to talk about it on a daily basis. Thanks for listening and watching my news and comment podcast. I remain your humble host, Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.